had an idea of what I was going to present. And then about two days ago, I had a different idea. So I changed everything, <laughs> which is kind of typical of the way I, the way I think. <laughs> I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint, unfortunately, but uh, a lot easier to show you around the studio since I'm not actually there. This is not what it normally looks like. I, I took this photograph when I was packaging up um, a bunch of pieces for a show a few months ago. It becomes a uh, staging operation at that point. But generally, um, I think of my studio as, um, as, an, as an ongoing conversation. Uh, it's a place I go to work, but since I'm there alone most of the time, I'm constantly speaking with all of the other characters who are there. And, and I, I, I don't hear their voices necessarily, but I, I depend on them for clues as to what I should be doing next. This, this is actually the heart of my studio. It's my work table and it's, it's a place where I rarely work, but uh, you can see it in the, in the upper portion there, probably 50 sketchbooks. That's a fraction of what I have. I am sketching constantly. Sketchbooks for me, uh, you know, it's, it's not that linear. It's not like I start one and, and finish it. Um, I will have four or five going at once. There's one in my pocket. There's one on my dresser. There's one in my car. There's one in my coat. And wherever I happen to be, when I, when I have a minute or when I have an idea, I pull one out. There is a chronology, but that chronology is usually spaced over maybe four or five different sketchbooks at once. That may seem chaotic, but there's actually a method for that. When I was creative director, I really enjoyed uh, keeping my team off balance by throwing them information that they didn't expect or asking them to do something, uh, a method that they weren't uh, accustomed to, constantly mixing things up, switching things out. So when I'm sketching in multiple sketchbooks, I'll, I'll have an idea and I'll open a book and I'll start working. Uh, a few minutes into that, I'll pick up a different book and continue the thread there or pick up another book and continue the thread there or get stuck for an idea and pull a book off the shelf that's a year, two years, three years old and just start thumbing through pages. And something I will see will trigger an idea that either fits with the current thread or I see a solution to something that was never resolved earlier. So my process is, is very fluid. It is intentionally chaotic. It is intentionally not, um, not structured. But the idea is I'll, I'll pick up a thread and I'll just play with it until I run out of ideas. But running out of ideas is not, is not something I encounter very often. The, the process that I use is a sequence of questions that I ask myself with every sketch. What if, what else, and why not? Every single sketch goes through that process. And if I don't come up with an answer, I'll do the sketch again. And somewhere in the process of doing that sketch, I might intentionally let the pencil wander or um, maybe put the pencil in my other hand, do, do something, anything to, to mix things up. So uh, I thought what, what might be fun tonight is, is not to talk about the process so much as, as demonstrate it. The next few slides are a demonstration of what a week in my studio is, is actually like. This is a piece that I did several years ago. It was an unusual piece in that I did the mask and I did the painting. And one day I just hung the two of them together and I thought, well, that works. So I sold it as a pair. Sunday as I was sketching for some reason, that, that piece came to mind. And I thought it might be interesting to revisit that idea of a mask and painting in combination. These sketches were actually done in 2019 when I was visiting Arizona. I think that might've been the origin of this idea of two and three dimensional pieces combined. I probably had seven or eight sketches in that series it never went anywhere from there. But Sunday, as I came back to this idea again, one sketch leads to another, to another, 
and to another. And then I throw in some watercolor just to see what else I can do with it. Just playing with the idea of, of how do I integrate two and three dimensions so that they appear to uh, work well together. And I carry the idea further. Again, the, the what if, what else, why not? The sketch at the bottom here hit it's something new. I have done a number of masks where half of the mask is form and half of the mask is space. So playing with positive and negative. And I thought, here we go. You know, So how does that fit into this idea of a mask and a panel in combination? So then, then I started just playing with this positive, negative, two faces. Talking to myself was the the working title for this one. And again, you can see, you know, these sketches take 30 seconds a piece, sometimes a minute and a half, I don't know. But the idea is, is not to deliberate, but to just keep churning and churning and churning and see what happens. And with, with every sketch, I change the mouth, change the eyes, change the hair, change something. But every one gives me another clue as to how I'm going to resolve this when I go to three dimension. So Tuesday, I walk into my studio and I remembered this watercolor that I had done about four years ago. I dug it out of the shelf, I put it up in the middle of the table and I started exploring how could I turn this face into a mask? How could I use that kind of a background? So that then another series of sketches and I'm again playing with uh, the half mask, half form, half negative space. So I have a theory that if you're not creating a problem to solve, you're not being very creative. So in this case, I have now created a problem. And um, <laughs> you'll, you'll see in the next few slides how I, how I have attempted to resolve it. But the idea now is I, I, have, I have a, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor on the screen, I have the, the positive side of the mask, the negative side of the mask is the, is the foundation panel that I'm going to paint on. And the problem now is how do I paint on a two-dimensional surface and a three-dimensional surface and integrate them. So I went back to a photograph of my, uh, my original mask and painting piece. I pulled a couple of masks off the shelf. I put a few panels on the table and I just started visualizing how this was going to work. A process that I have referred to many times as visualization to realization. There's an idea in your head. Getting it from your head to a physical form is the challenge. And with every solution, you generally create another problem. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. And this is part of the conversation I mentioned at the very beginning. I mean, it's not exactly talking to myself, but it is sort of in a way thinking out loud, but letting the piece inform me and just taking the time to observe and understand it, not trying to rush the process through this. So this was Wednesday that I got to. The next thing is to scale that sketch up to life size or slightly larger than life size. I'm using tracing paper here because I can just retrace and retrace doing these uh, subtle, subtle changes between, between each sketch. And then I have a panel in the background there at the top where I'm actually laying the, the tissue paper over the panel and, and visualizing, is this the right size? Is this going to work in this position? And thinking my way through, with rethinking, redrawing constantly. The next step in the process is to take that pattern tape it down to a piece of, this is a, a, thin, a thin corrugated board that's used for architectural models. It's, uh, it's fairly rigid. It cuts well, it scores well, it bends well. I could do all kinds of things with it. Uh, in this case, once it's cut out, the entire perimeter is, uh, is taped with, I think I used a, a 16 gauge wire. And then when I bend everything, it stays where I put it. So this was, this was Wednesday. By Thursday, I had a fully formed mask. So this now has several layers of, of uh, 
paper impregnated with a polymer, and then I'd use a polymer with some other additives to give me a, a uh, plaster clay-like surface, which gives me a really wonderful texture to paint on. And now the, the problem that I've created is starting to become more and more apparent. When I put that onto the panel, I don't know how I'm gonna paint this thing and make it believe. At this point, I think I've convinced myself, I'm not sure yet, that this mask needs to be a freestanding piece and that the mask that goes on the panel needs to be a fully formed mask, not a positive negative thing, but a, a full mask. So that's probably what I'll be wrestling with uh, in the studio tomorrow. But while I'm in the studio this afternoon playing with this, I put a base coat on, on the mask itself and I pulled another form off the shelf that I've been working on. This one has no head. So I just put the two together to see what that looks like. Well, that's interesting. The, the body in this case is kind of facing one side and the mask is facing another. So that's not quite cohesive enough, but it's, it's a thought. So this is an ongoing problem. Now I have, I have uh, it, may, it may resolve itself tomorrow. It may take weeks, but um, what I'm enjoying and, and especially the past couple of years is just having the time to think. If I'm not happy with where something is at, put it on the shelf, put it on the wall, look at it for a week, a month, and bring it back. I have, have several pieces in the studio I started to paint two months ago, and I didn't like where the painting was going. So I put it aside, and I'll wait. I'll walk in one day, and I'll look at it, and I'll know what to do with it. <laughs> so this process of, of sketching, to, uh, sketching to form is, is pretty consistent. What is inconsistent is sometimes in four or five sketches, I'll know where I'm going. I'll throw some watercolor on it. And in this case, that was the finished piece. And that was just a matter of a couple of days. Title for this one is Second Thought. And that came to me almost immediately when, when, I, was, um, when I was creating it. This is one of the pieces that's hanging at PDX Commons. This started out as a fully formed mask. And as I played with it, suddenly the whole surface of the mask disappeared and just the eyes and the mouth remain. The rest of it is simply a perimeter. One of the challenges I, I create for myself is to never reproduce something I've done before. Find, you know, maybe take, take two themes that I've done before and combine them. Take a, a technique that I've used before and combine it with a different technique. But for me to try and duplicate a piece is, is it's impossible. <laughs> I get three or four steps in and the what if takes over. And, you know, what if I put this arm on the other side? What if I put the head underneath? What if I, you know, and, and immediately it, it becomes a, a completely different piece. I have had a, com I had a commission last year where I was asked to do two identical pieces. Two pieces isn't, isn't enough to justify making a mold. So I did them as close as I could but I, I, had told the, I had told the collector that they're not going to be identical. That was okay. And he liked it. And he said, well, I want to give one of these away. Can you make a third? <laughs> and then he came back and said, I want, to, I want to auction two of them off for a charity. Can you do two more? So I wound up doing five pieces. In the end, you look at them and it's all the same pose. It's all the same idea, but they are all slightly different. And of course, the tendency is, well, I've done this before. I can make it better. Well, if you make it better, you're going to make it different. So it, it, was, it was painful. These, these are a few of the other pieces that are hanging in the window at, uh, at PDX Commons. The one on the left, uh, the title is How. And it, I, don't, I don't often integrate wildlife into a mask, but these are several examples where the one on the right has a... a the one on the right is titled Speaking of Birds. Two of these are fairly old. Uh, the one on the left is, is fairly new, just the last couple of weeks. And I, I, birds fascinate me for some reason. I, I come back to them frequently. Uh, one more example of uh, a few quick sketches. This Again, this is one that I think put itself together in, in about a week. 
And I think this is the last one in the series. A few more of the pieces that are, uh, that are on display at PDX Commons. So the, you know, here you can see the constantly playing with positive and negative and ambiguity, another theme I like. That's the bulk of, of what I've got to share. I'm, I'm gonna let you folks ask me questions because I can, I can talk about the same things, but I think if I allow you to ask me questions, we might, might get to some different information. I've got a question. You, you mentioned uh, petroglyphs. Is that where you get some of your ideas from, or have you looked closely at those, or how do those influence you? Petroglyphs were the original inspiration. I was visiting Sedona about probably five or six years ago now, and painting watercolor. I was a very traditional watercolor painter and started sketching some petroglyphs. And out of the blue came the idea of what an interesting style that would be for sculpture. I hadn't done a sculpture in probably 25 years or more. I was very conscious not to copy specific designs, but to imitate the, the styles. So all the pieces that I have done have been pieces of my own creation. I'm not appropriating something. But what, what fascinated me about that is you're pecking away at a rock. It may take hours or days to, to create that image. That's not like graffiti where you just you know, dash something off and run. That was, I believe, a meditative process. And I believe that what was, what was going on was that the, the creators were actually doing was um, invoking the archetypes of these, of these characters. So I see most of the characters that I'm creating as archetypal characters, not in the Jungian sense, but they are archetypes of qualities, human qualities or, or situations. So there is always some narrative in the back of my mind, uh, which usually integrates itself into, into the title at some point. Most of your pieces that I've seen so far are of a, a scale. They, they, they all seem to be what within the, in the realm of two feet high, two feet wide kind of thing there's a scale to them. Have you ever thought about, or do you even think it's important as to the scale? And, and take a mask, for example. It's got, a, it's got an impact on people when it's life-size. And, and what hits my brain is, what if it was the size of a mural on the side of a Philadelphia building? <laughs> what impact would that have? <laughs> do you think about that? There isn't. <clears throat> there is another artist here in Portland who has done several masks that are four feet wide, five feet wide. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to encroach on his turf in the mask world. Um, I have proposals out to do several of my sculptures, uh, seven feet high. So slightly okay. larger than human scale. Uh, those would be uh, bronze or uh, polyurethane over architectural foam. Uh, reproducing the colors, the challenge. The, the colors can be reproduced in patinas over bronze. Uh, maintaining that color when they're exposed to weather is the challenge. At some point, I'm, I'm certain I will do something on, on a larger scale. I worked with um, Marty Eichinger, who's a, a sculptor here in Portland, who's done almost I don't know, he's, he's done probably a half dozen pieces that are life scale seven or eight feet tall. And from the day we met, he's been pestering me to go big, go really big. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would be right behind him with that. <laughs> I'll tell him that. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have glass of wine with him next week. I'll, I'll tell him he's not alone. <laughs> the, I mean, there is, there is something when you encounter something that is your own scale or larger. Um, that's significant. You, I mean, you, you experience it 
much differently than yeah, if it's that, something that's my question itself. yeah that that is i think is i guess the my real question is do you think it would have a difference in the impact of the piece absolutely okay um when i photograph pieces i always photograph them from a low angle uh, because in my mind they are they are huge <laughs> So when I when I photograph them, I can play with them and, and imagine them. When uh, when I'm when I'm teaching when I'm teaching sculpture, I have uh, I have my students working on pieces that might be six inches tall, but I'll frequently have them hold it up so that you know they're looking up at it as if they were inside of it. And even even that little silly exercise changes their perception of scale. I'm curious about um, how color, when color enters into your problem solving and how um, you resolve problems having to do with color? Color usually comes later, but not always. Only because it's graphite on paper okay. is, is, is so quick. But I, I have sketchbooks laying around the studio constantly. And it's not unusual to walk past one. It'll catch my eye. I'll grab my palette and, and throw some watercolor over it. Sometimes I'll just start with watercolor because I love watercolor. It's a bit like reading a poem and then one day you read it in a different language and it has different meaning for you. When, and, I, and I love to switch media. I love to, the, the, the whole idea of masks, for example, uh, my first mask came from a small piece that I did. I liked the face, but the face was only two inches tall. I thought that really ought to be bigger. So I made a, a mask with two foot ears on it. And seeing it, seeing it at my scale changed my perception of it. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Moving to masks, opened up another whole realm of, of possibilities. But the idea of going from uh, graphite to watercolor to collage, I, I frequently photograph things I'm working on before I leave the studio at the end of the day. And I have a, uh, a dumbed down version of Photoshop on my phone. Uh, I could sit in the living room and, and just manipulate color I will frequently try multiple color schemes just to see what feels right. <clears throat> sometimes it's collage. Sometimes uh, I have I've done in the past year or so a whole series of these same characters in uh, in acrylic paint on on eight by eight inch panels. So I I think moving around from one media to the other. Helps me get to know some of the characters better. Uh, it almost always triggers another idea for another piece. When you were showing us the one that you had just done the sketch of, and then we saw it in red, that was just uh, a, an amazing transformation. <laughs> I, I am frequently surprised. I mean, the, the idea of, I, I had added, I think there was some, uh, some burnt sienna that I added to the polymer. I just wanted to see what would happen. <laughs> I was I was like that as a kid. I was always breaking things because I would I would do something just to see what would happen. Um, I think I drove my dad crazy with stuff like that, but that's how I learned. I mean, that's how I learned everything. I have I have a I mean, you, <clears throat> I, I I tell my students you don't learn anything from victory. You learn learn a lot from mistakes. So I encourage mistakes. I, I mean, mistakes are healthy. A few years back, you seem to have a sort of strong political and social message in a lot of your work. You had groups of people. Sometimes you had a feeling of isolation or um, did, are, are you thinking about any kind of sort of social messages or political messages at the moment in your work? It doesn't sort of come out. I, I'm not saying you have to do that, but I, I you seem to be on, on a different sort of level at the moment. So I was just curious to see what kind of messages, if any, you're, you're trying to convey. 
I've, I've only done a few pieces that are overtly political. There are spiritual, political, social themes that run through everything. What I hope to do with, with my pieces is not to, not to preach, but to put something out there that reflects something you can understand. So it's, it's not really about me. I've already had my experience in creating them. The next experience is, is your experience in understanding them. So, um, I mean, some people see political messages in a piece that I've done. And when they tell me that, it's like, I don't get it. But that's okay, too. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. The, for me, the, you know, when it's finished, it's just a thing. Creating it, going through the process of question and answer and the, and the what if and the what else and all of that, that's, that's the art. The creating a problem and trying to understand how to solve it. That's the art. When it's finished, it's just a thing. But it's validated when someone else responds to it. Like it, hate it, misinterpret, anything, doesn't matter. Ignoring a piece is the only insult for me. <laughs> yeah, Chaz, Chaz, I was thinking about that when they, you had the gentleman who wanted you to make eventually five copies, so to speak. And, and I don't know if it's because they were archetypal or whatever, but I could see where each of the five people that received or the four people that received those would respond to them in a different way or, or assign a different meaning to them or would respond or react to them differently. I mean, do you find that a lot with your archetypal work that you, you might see a certain way, but then obviously different people based on their life experience, will see it a different way. Usually, um, usually people see something I didn't. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, after years in advertising, I've got a pretty thick skin, so it's, it's pretty hard to offend me. I've, I've heard some pretty unusual comments and I just have to laugh. I mean, I, 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 never, I never know where they're coming from. Mm. But when you, when you put a piece out there, it's, it's almost like... Um, It's almost like baiting a hook. I mean, you know, some people feel they have to have to share with you what they're what they're seeing, and sometimes yeah. it is really fascinating. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Well, I have a comment actually. I I, I just wanted to. I'm I'm just so uh, impressed with your work. I've I've always been impressed with your work, Chaz, and and I I really appreciate. You're showing us the process that you go through to create the end result. I mean, it, it knowing the how you because you know everybody just sees the final product, but how you got there and the and the 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 um, the struggles and the chances that you take and the 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 combination of inspiration for you to get there is it's it's uh, it's fascinating and it's it, it makes the final piece that much more valuable. In, intrinsically well, thank, thank you for um for those of you uh, that's marty geller marty and i have known each other uh since the late 60s early 70s at pratt institute we were we were best friends and uh have remained have remained friends ever since when when i was working with um marty eichinger the, the sculptor here in portland you know i'd always thought that excuse me, when you're, when you're making a piece of art, there's, there's something sacred about what you're making. And he, uh, he was working on a piece one day and it was, it was a, a clay model about four feet tall. And there was something about the anatomy. Uh, he, he's a fairly realistic uh, sculptor. Something about the anatomy that was bothering him and it, it wasn't right. And it continued to bother him. And he'd come in every day and look at it and ask me, you know, what is it? What is it? And I, I didn't see it. I came in one day and he'd taken the arm off. I thought, well, what are you doing? He said, it wasn't right. I'm going to put it back on in the right place. The idea that um, 
-hmm. if something isn't right, you break it and fix it was a revelation for me. The, the peace itself is not sacred. It's the only, the only thing sacred is, is your satisfaction with it. And ever since then, I mean, I, I have done that several times now with a piece where something's in the wrong place, take it apart, put it back together again. There's something very satisfying about doing that. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like when you finally fix a rattle in your car that's been bothering you forever. You know, it, it's that kind of thing. It's not, it, it's maybe not something major, but it's something that's just an annoyance until you fix it, until you solve it. We had talked about your putting up some of the drawings with the finished pieces. And I think that would be just really interesting for the viewer to be able to see the process on the wall. The, the challenge there is, I mean, you, you saw like stacks and stacks of sketchbooks. I, I mean, this, literally the sketchbooks that I have in my studio go back to the 1960s. There's nothing for me more fun than just pulling one out from 1978. And there's usually a note or two referencing something that I was doing. But it's, it's interesting how, to me, a theme that I was working on in 1972 is still alive in, in my imagination. I might have revisited that multiple times over the decades. And every time I might have executed it completely differently. But the fact that, you know, there's something that's with you that long. I, I mean, I, I assume writers have similar things, themes that they, uh, they explore and revisit from time to time just adds a lot more texture to the, to the, to the narrative that, that I'm playing with when I'm, when I'm creating them. <coughs> Excuse me. Jess, I, I've got one more question for you. Obviously, part of what you do has to, I've heard you talk about the process of forming the wire when you're doing a, when you're doing a piece and you'll, model yourself and you'll pose yourself and imagine what what an arm should look like and so on and go through that process to make the shape and yeah i think it's that's you I, there's no question in my mind that's you <laughs> but but there's such a huge tendency seems to be today to do it digitally and forget the the, the feel and the touch of what it takes to make that happen do you have any kind of inclination to go in that direction or are we going to get to keep having you do what you do? Um, I have, I've explored the digital realm and there are, there are, I mean, in order to, to take a, a two foot piece and turn it into a seven foot piece, there are some wonderful digital techniques, 3d scans and then 3d printing. Uh, you can actually, do 3D printing of the casting molds. So there's, there's lots of room for digital, but in the actual creation itself, I love the, the tactile nature. Yeah, yeah I, 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 and, and I, I know that about you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I mean, I, I look at digital art all the time and there is something mechanically rigidly perfect about it about and flat the human form is not perfect <laughs> the human body is not perfectly symmetrical nearly but not perfectly symmetrical mm -hmm. and i exaggerate that quite a bit i mean if if, if you got out a tape measure and started measuring mm -hmm. limbs on my pieces <laughs> the legs are you know sometimes off by 10 percent mm -hmm. uh, i will exaggerate what i need to get the gesture that i'm looking for and, it, and it, it, the gesture is really the essence of it. You can spot a friend a block away and you recognize them by their gesture, by their body mm -hmm. language, the way they hold themselves, the way they move in space, long before you recognize their face. An actor on a stage knows that their body communicates much more than their expression. And I mean, a dancer lives by that. So I'm, I'm aware of all of that, even though I can't dance, I am aware of how, um, how a body 
works in space is essential to how you respond to it. I'll take that a step further. Um, so in, in film or in theater, every scene ends with an unanswered question. That's what creates suspense. That's what engages you. It's what makes you want to know what's going to happen next. And your mind is immediately trying to solve that problem. I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. But at the end of the next scene, there's yet another question. And then another question. I believe that space does the same thing for sculpture that that unanswered question does for a scene. It engages you, it makes you want to wonder, it makes you want to look around the object, move through the object or explore it. And if I get somebody to completely walk around a sculpture, I, I did it, I did my job. If they keep walking around it, then I really did the job. But, <laughs> but the idea is, you know, you look at the form and you think that's the sculpture but it's the space that's holding the form up that is working on your psyche. That's, that's what engages you. <clears throat> and to, to get there, if I have to stretch an arm or shorten a leg or put a neck off center, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to render things realistically. Um, I mean, I've, I've done that before. It's not nearly as fun. Anybody else? I have a question, Chaz. My name is Timmy and I'm in, I'm in San Diego. What's it like when you collaborate with another artist? What, what are the new problems? What are the new challenges? What are the new opportunities? That's a very timely question. Um, <laughs> I am a member of Pacific Northwest Sculptors. Several years ago, we did a show called Unmatched Pairs, where sculptors paired up with another. Most of us crossed media, mm -hmm. and we each displayed one piece of our own and one piece in collaboration. I collaborated with an LED artist, and it was a, it was a layered sculpture with multiple sets of lighting inside of it and then a, a small processor on the back. The lights changed color, they changed intensity, and they changed their cycles. When, when I worked in advertising, I was always, uh, as an art director, I was paired up with, with a writer. And it was always the first project or two when you were paired up with a new, a new writer where you'd suggest something, the writer would suggest something. Oh, did you mean this? No, I didn't mean that at all. I meant this. <laughs> but that's kind of an interesting idea. What if we did that? And it, it was that misinformation, miscommunication, stair-stepping to an idea that neither one of you could have had on your own. But by going through this process of <clears throat> not understanding each other's connotations, yeah. you, get to, uh, you get to some pretty interesting places. That's part of the reason I really enjoy uh, listening to feedback on my work. It, it does and it doesn't influence me, but occasionally you hear this little gem that was like something you never thought of before. Right. And it, eventually it'll, you know, some element of that will find its way in, into a piece. I sure appreciate everybody's time on a Friday night when masks yeah. are coming off and we can start being social again, which is a great idea, I think. Yeah. The entire show that is visible uh, at PDX Commons is visible on my website, chasmartin.com slash PDX. It's a collection of pieces that I see every day in my studio, but they're fighting for attention with all the other stuff in my studio. <laughs> when they are separate and have their own place, they seem to play differently together. So it's, it's it's a treat for me to see them all together somewhere else. It's like putting them out in, in the world. I sure appreciate all of your questions and your attention. Yeah. Uh, thanks for spending your evening with me. Thanks for the invite, Chaz. It's been great.